Right. This conference will now be recorded. All right. I'd like to call to order the Village of Ashwaubenon and Finance and Personnel Committee, Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. Roll call, please. Tracy Fluke? Here. Allison Burnett? Here. Chris Erbel? Here. Kelly Service? Here. And Tom Salk's excused. Right. Please stand up for Pledge of Allegiance. And please keep in mind all the service members home and abroad that are helping to protect our country. Um, action on the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 aye, aye. Motion passes. Action on minutes. Finance and Personnel Committee regular meeting from September 20th, 2022. To approve. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion passes. Comments from the public. Must be limited to items not on the agenda. Must state name and address. Limited to five minutes. Board's role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personal issues cannot be discussed nor individual named. Uh, board is not able to take action at this meeting. Uh, anybody in the crowd? No, no I think no. Nope. And nobody on the interweb, I believe. So we will move on. Action items. Uh, 7A Village Assessor update on assessment ratios, or 7-1, I should say. That'd be me. Hi. That's, oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the most recent ratios came out. Um, they're not, they need to put in manufacturing values yet, but typically they, it doesn't change really much at all. It's currently at 88.9%, which means that we're out of, currently out of compliance. Um, you get five years to get back into compliance. The longer you wait, um, you know, there's being in the yang with it, the longer you wait, um, the more of a difference there is. Um, like currently, if we were to wait until next year, the average homeowner might see around 20 to 25% increase in their assessed value. It doesn't always translate to tax dollars because um, the tax rate goes down. But every, it's becoming a trend now where every two years, the village of Ashwaubenon is getting out of compliance with the state of Wisconsin. Hmm. You're supposed to be at within 10% of market value. So um, market value is 100%, so it's between 90 and 110. Um, and it was, it was recently brought up to maybe uh, propose to do uh, like an ongoing schedule like some other municipalities have started doing um, where every, I believe three years is what we discussed, might be best that way we're always it's not so much of a shock or a sudden hey we need to do a, a revaluation and you know that way it's more more planned and structured and so one of the things that we talked with with paul about is we we did a partial market adjustment back in 2021 uh, for just the residential class properties coming from the throes of the pandemic uh, we did not review commercial class properties at that time, primarily because uh, they weren't out of compliance when we looked at the, those properties individually. And in clarification from the state, DOR, municipalities were allowed to perform adjustments to specific classes of property as a result of the pandemic and, and non-compliance issues. Um, so we did do a market, we did do a market adjustment uh, in 2021 for residential class, I, I believe we got closer to a 94%. We were trying to get it at, at commercial level. Yeah, it was right. right at 94 for both classes. Uh, and then since that time, obviously the housing market has continued to be very competitive. Um, the pandemic has obviously waned or the impacts of the pandemic have waned uh, for commercial properties. And so we are now seeing our properties being under assessed to their equalized value, uh, and Paul kind of go through where, where we anticipate both residential and commercial. 
Um, so ultimately what the, the proposal will be going into next year would be to do a market adjustment for all classes of property. So residential, commercial, the state does manufacturing. And then from there, basically going on a three year cycle or three year rotation in order to maintain compliance regardless of market conditions. So recognizing that we've been in a very hot residential market as of late with interest rates changing and, and you know some concerns about inflation and maybe the potential for recession. What will that do to the housing market by going on a routine and regular schedule? We will always maintain compliance under the statutes uh, by having that three year rotation. So I'll you know, kind of pass it back to Paul and kind of talk about where we're at currently in our ratio. Yeah, typically uh, the, the trend has been around um, around 8% per year for residential. Um, commercial currently is is uh, around 3% increase per year since COVID. Prior to COVID, it was more like a 6%. Um, there's, each municipality has your primary classes. Uh, for, for most, it's residential and commercial. Some, depending on where you go in the rural areas, you get more agricultural, but primary classes are where your most value is. So if one of those classes goes out of compliance, the entire village also goes out of compliance. So it's the overall ratio. And then the second thing too is if one of those primary classes gets above or below that 10%, that too will go out of compliance. Um, so currently it's, it's at 8% residential is, means our 8% a year means we decrease 8% per year um, for residential. And we decrease 3% per year, per year for commercial. I would expect that next year to be more like 4 or even 5% because commercial is improving and getting stronger since COVID. Um, that typically makes a net change of 5 or 6% per year. Currently we're at 88.9, so 5 or 6% off of that if we you know, if, if we do a market adjustment for 2024, then you're talking more like 78% or, it, it depends on what the market does. Um, interest rates are going up. Um, you know, the, the housing market is changing, but that just means like an 8% might be, you know, for residential an 8% per year increase might be more like 4% or 5%. I don't ever see it unless it unless it does you know what happened during the recession I don't necessarily see it ever going the other way I I see it slowing down but I see us increasing every year regardless it's just there's too much demand for the village of Ashraven and the market's too strong here and, and certainly housing in general in the northeast Wisconsin Brown County region obviously still strong uh, so the demand for housing is is still there, albeit maybe it's lessening as, a re as it relates to inflationary pressures or interest rates, but the demand is still there. Um, we're still seeing uh, requests for additional development in the community for housing units. So we're not necessarily seeing the decline to where it would point us to the fact that there's a decrease in value. Right, the, the increase is just as Paul had mentioned, slowing maybe to what it was at, at its peak. <clears throat> so if you maybe have heard in the, the news recently or, or you know, in the community, the city of Green Bay um, recently went through a full revaluation to which point their values were, I think near 30%, like 29% increase does create a lot of concern from your citizens when you see those types of increases, primarily because, albeit somewhat simple, they don't quite understand the relation between your assessed value and what you're paying in property taxes to your municipality. Um, but at the end of the day, it does create a fair, fair and equitable method for determining how much you owe. Um, the state ultimately determines through equalized value what your community is worth it's the assessor's job and the assessment process to get that assessment as close to that equalized value, 100%, as much as possible because by doing that, it's determined constitutionally that that is equitable and fair. So that's all the assessor's doing is trying to divide the pie, if you will, equally or fairly or equitably, I should say, amongst all the property owners 
based on the value that is being established by the state through the equalized value process. So, Paul, can you explain the difference between a market adjustment and a revaluation that Green Bay just went through? Um, it's, it's one and the same. Revaluation um, is the main category. Within it, you could do a full which is we send letters out, we go to every single property um, and try to get in their house and do a walkthrough. And then there's a market adjustment where every single parcel still gets reviewed. Um, we, but we do it based on the best known information available, which is permits, what's in the property record card currently, GIS mapping, count, you know, anything from the county or what we have on record. And we do um, neighborhood adjustments, you know, per, like a neighborhood over here, obviously, is going to be quite different, you know, more towards the peer area, and it's so each each and every parcel gets looked at based on their neighborhood grouping, um, and it's all it's all from our desks. Um, sometimes we'll do we we have to do updated photos every so often, you know, each 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 improvement value, which just means a structure or a building. Um, it, it all gets updated photos and. Um, that's the that's a market adjustment, but if the other one's a full revaluation, that that we haven't done in some time. There was a law that changed in 2016 or 17, I believe, uh, where people, if they didn't, it used to be if they didn't let us into their house, they could not appeal their assessment at the board of review. That changed, so a lot of people when they send when they see our letters, they don't, they're not necessarily letting us in we found once that law changed. So the common practice in the city of Green Bay too, they did a market adjustment. They didn't do a full revaluation. So is it typical now to do market adjustments versus a revaluation or is there a point where all of a sudden you would still have to do a revaluation sometime in the future? Uh, a full revaluation, because uh, the market adjustment still is a revaluation, uh, but a full re it, it depends on, everything's different. It, it depends on what you're aiming for. Um, one, one time there was, it was brought up that there was a lot of homes in this certain municipality where they didn't have finished basements, where people knew that there was a lot of finished basements. So that was, they put a little, that was more of a, more of a market adjustment where we did it from our desk, but with a little wrinkle in it where they wanted us to identify basements that were unfinished and then we sent letters out to those and we got in. Um, other communities that might want a full revaluation are rural areas where people don't take out permits and they want us on every parcel on every property. So it's certain, every situation is different. Thank you. So I understand being, what, what the numbers are being in compliance. Um, what I, I don't grasp is is by law, how often do you, how do I want to say this? How much, obviously you have a variance, you have some time frame where you, you're able, you're not, you're not always going to be in compliance. Correct. So what kind of date range do you, do you have? How often do you have to report to the state to let them know that we're in compliance? And the reason I ask that is if, if, if we're going to do this, you know, consider like every, three years and obviously it's going to cost us something but um in the end really it's it's it, it, it's all related to our our tax rates and 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 maybe the the our our the people aren't going to get billed I'm, I'm i'm struggling how to how to get this across um the taxes aren't going to change for our average residents is this more a cosmetic thing so so that we're not in a position that Green Bay is in where all of a sudden the residents are getting these assessments and going, oh my God. There's a lot of different reasons, yeah. We, you know, we, we'll tell municipalities, we'll, you know, we'll inform them when everyone's out of compliance, but we, we always wait to be told what to do. Um, we, we've, we, we've gone where people have gone out of and back into compliance. It's based on the market. You know, if the market goes crazy, then you're gonna get out of compliance and a lot of people, like you said, they want to maintain at or near market value and do it more often so you're not sending out 30% or 40% or recently the town of rights down saw 50%. Um, it, you know, it depends on how long you want to wait. 
And then uh, there's, I don't know how it translates, but there is something to do with the tax rate where the closer you are to market value, you either get to levy more or the tax rate gets adjusted. So it is, I don't understand necessarily that side of it, but I know there's, there's financial reasons behind maintaining a close to market value. On a more consistent basis. Correct. Right. Okay. So the, the, the statutes require um, to stay within compliance within 10% of, of equalized value, so up or down, so 110% or 90%. If you get out of compliance, and Paul, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, you have five years to correct it then. Oh, okay, that, I guess that kind of answers my question. Yeah, once you're out of compliance, right. yep. then the clock starts. You have five years, and once you start, you can start it on the fifth year, um, and then get into compliance, but if it gets to year six, then they truly come up from Madison and they do it for you. Okay, oh, that makes sense. Okay, so then what, what you're saying is is based on, you know, what's been happening lately. We, we've been, we're, we're, historically, we would be out of compliance every two or three years. Yeah. So, we, okay. Yeah, correct. Okay. That's, that's what the trend has been. Even commercial was, you know, we all remember the market Housing, commercial, everything prior to COVID was just, it was increasing very rapidly. And even after COVID, it's still, it's still, you know, if COVID didn't happen, I would like to think we'd be out of compliance every single year. Okay. Um, it, it's a common misconception by property owners to know that if your assessed value increases, that your taxes will increase. That yeah. they're, they're they're intertwined, but they're not necessarily they're mutually exclusive of each other. So the taxing jurisdictions, um, if they keep their levies exactly equal year over year, and your assessed value increases, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be paying more in taxes because now it becomes in relation to what other values have increased by a percentage. So if your value, all all tax levies being equal. Your value went up 10%, but the average assessed value in the community went up 12%, you'll in fact see a reduction in your tax bill. Right. Um, in my prior community, see, that's the other thing in many communities now, especially like fast growing communities with a lot of single family residential development, they're going to annual market adjustments because of the volatility in the market. So there'll be situations where a five year old home is paying considerably more in property taxes than a new home because of market conditions from when it, when it was constructed. So by making sure that those ratios is, are as close to 100%, it creates that equity. So what we found in those situations is that that homeowner that has a five-year-old or 10-year-old home, they'll actually see a pretty substantial reduction in their taxes because the levies were maintained and the percent increase on their home value was not equal to that of one of the newer homes that came in. So it's all about creating fairness and equity amongst the taxpayers so that they're paying their fair, their fair share of the pie. The pie stays the same. Yep. It's just a matter of how big your slice is within right. that pie tin. Okay. Okay, thank you. So what's, what's your plan? You're going to do... Uh, the plan would be moving forward for what we discussed was next year, or we start, start now, um, to do a market adjustment for all locally assessed classes, which means all classes except for manufacturing, because the oh. state does that. And what percent? 100. We'll get them at 100. That's what we were mm -hmm. contracted to do. And um, and then from then do on a, a three-year cycle where mm -hmm. every three years we, you know, we do another market adjustment. Uh, unless, you know, unless the village or the board wants full revaluation or, you know, if, if down the road too, if you see a change or if you see something that, you know, a need for something else, obviously it's mm -hmm. fine with us. Paul, do you have an idea what the cost would be to do it? Uh, right around 90 grand, 90,000 90. for a market adjustment. Are we unique um, in these time for, you know, the, 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 the adjustment cycles here with the being in compliance and we're out of compliance, is Eshwabinen kind of unique in that? Or do you find that quite a bit? Uh, right now we're finding it with all, with, okay. yeah. For you talking like every few years you're getting yeah. on a, 
Yes, every we're getting contacted by all of our municipalities. They're all getting out of compliance, and uh, the city of De Pere is doing it annually because they 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 are big on housing. So they're I think they are decreasing like ten or eleven percent a year. Village of Howard, we've had we've been doing every three years for the Village of Howard since the late '90s, early 2000s. Um, and they did it regardless, I believe regardless of what the market did, just to make sure that you have equity. Okay. Anything else? I mean, basically it's a way to keep the taxes um, consistent for everybody, mm -hmm. whether it's commercial business, residential business, and instead of waiting until we get so far out of compliance where then we do the valuation and people are getting like Green Bay at 40, 30% increase. Um, so it's keeping it consistent and fair for everybody is, is really what you're proposing. Yeah, and it, it gives everyone an opportunity um, to appeal. You know, it gives people an opportunity to review their assessments. It's when we do a maintenance, every year's a maintenance year and we're not allowed to adjust for the market on a maintenance year. So it may not be fair to some people that are being assessed at a certain rate where the market was just going crazy, say by the title town district. And two or three years from now, you know, obviously it won't happen, but say it, it's the opposite, say for whatever reason, those t those people would still be getting taxed at that very, you know, it gives, it gives people the chance to appeal and contact me because the market did change where otherwise they would not be able to because it's a maintenance year and it's against Department of Revenue standards. All right, anything else? Um, so what are you looking from us? So this is just more of an advisory uh, update. This is something that's gonna be included and incorporated in the 2023 budget. So just as an FYI to the committee prior to the budget process, even though we completed the um, market adjustment a year ago, we'll be looking to do it again for those reasons. And then moving forward, hopefully looking at uh, a three-year cycle um, for future adjustments. Okay. So it's just kind of a, for your information. Okay. Is then based on your experience, do you have a guess what the increase is gonna be? Yeah, if, if, we, uh, if we were to do the uh, one, you know, for 2023, the average increase, I think, would be close to 20%. Uh, it might be, it depends on where you live, too, you know, it, it's going to be different all over. And if other areas see a larger increase, um, certain areas might see less. And just what Joel was talking about before, it kind of evens things out as far as their portion of the pie. So I would say it's going to be close to 20% now, if we start now, if we wait it. And it depends on the market. The market does even more of an adjustment than it could be more than, you know, it could be closer to 30 by 2024. So every three years we'll do commercial and residential at the same time then? We'll stick with both? All, yeah, all, all okay. classes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you. All right. Seven two. Didn't we used to always have A B C D and not one we two did. three? Okay. <laughs> seven, seven one. <laughs> seven two. Consider okay. discuss act on recommending adoption of a revised employee handbook. Joel. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Zerbel. Um, so with me today is Ann uh, Wettstein from Human Resources Consulting. Uh, they've been assisting us. Um, Ann has, in particular, been assisting us in the next. Three agenda items. The first one coming forward is the employee handbook. I do want to just kind of touch on the process that we use to draft this handbook. Uh, this is a complete rewrite, a complete rewrite of our existing handbook. Um, it was agreed by a, a, a staff committee. So what we did is we formed an internal staff committee made up of members of our staff team from every department um, that had different roles. We have line staff that worked in the field outdoors. We have office staff. We have technicians um, and supervisors that were involved in this process. Um, that committee felt that it was best to just, we'll start from ground zero and rewrite the handbook. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a red line version from our prior handbook because this is a complete overhaul. 
we felt that it would be a much cleaner process to to do that versus always working through a red line version because we are moving things top to bottom throughout the entire handbook. Um, what I'll touch on today is, you know, we went through this internal uh, committee process. It took several months to draft this. From there, this handbook was also forwarded on to our department heads for review and consideration and provided feedback for the final draft. And then our committee met one more time prior to tonight's meeting to review the handbook again to make sure that uh, we had sufficient clarity. Now this employee committee was really uh, um, given the direction to focus on the language, not necessarily on the policy end of things, but the language. Because what we found in the prior handbook is that some of the language may be uh, confusing or misleading or contradictory. And we wanted to make sure that the language in the handbook was understood across the organization so that regardless of where you sat within the org chart, it could be understood and, and to, to as best as practicable um, black and white. So with that, I'm, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the key critical changes. Um, so language may have changed uh, significantly in, in the new handbook versus the old handbook, but there were some policy changes as a result of this revision as well. And that's what I'll touch on are where those policy changes are found. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of zip through it and I, I trust that you have a copy of, of the handbook in your packet. Um, the first one would be found under section 1.05 and that's on page eight. And that's in relation to our anti-nepotism policy. This was an area that was of concern of our staff that for village policy, it should be considered against um, employment employee policy to have nepotism in the workplace. And basically that nepotism is for any permanent part or full-time employee. And it's all based on where you sit within the organization. So in our policy, we cannot hire a, um, an employee that would be a child or a direct uh, family member of a village trustee or the village manager. And the reason for that is that there is either a direct or indirect relationship between the employee and the supervisor. And so that's ultimately what this policy is intending to avoid, is that direct or indirect relationship between supervisor and employee. Now that does not mean that siblings or spouses or some other direct uh, relation can work for the village at the same time. There again cannot be a direct or indirect reporting relationship. So. Uh, employee A works for the Parks and Forestry Department and their spouse may be working for finance. Um, or that may be a bad example, but let's say the clerk's office, right? There is not a direct reporting relationship. There's no um, direct interaction between those two individuals. And so that would be okay. That doesn't preclude that only when we have those direct and indirect reporting assignments. Can I ask a question about that real quick, yep. Joel? Um, I'm assuming this is what it is, but a seasonal employee or a temporary employee does not, it's not fall into that, correct? So if I was like the parks director and I hired my daughter, my daughter got hired as a special aid, special children's aid, that would be fine. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and we did actually include the, in the original draft that we were working through, that was an included component of the policy. Um, but in talking with our individuals that work in parks and recreation, there were some concerns. As an example, one of our employees' daughter is good at dance, can teach dance, and under the policy language as it had been written, they would not be able to hire their daughter to teach dance. Um, and it is very hard to find dance instructors. So should we have it written to where they are able to hire their child in order to work that program when there are no other candidates available? to teach that, and that's essentially what happened in that situation. So we crafted it to only affect permanent part-time and full-time employees. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, skipping forward to section 2.09, that would be on page 17. Um, that section is related to performance reviews. So if you recall, um, I believe three months ago, we reviewed the process of our performance reviews mm -hmm. along with a draft kind of performance evaluation tool. 
This section basically details what we discussed at that meeting three months ago as it relates to the process. Essentially, towards the end of the, the latter part of the year or the last quarter of the year, the employees will begin a self-evaluation process. They'll sit down with their supervisors, review their self-evaluation, complete a goals and objectives uh, review for the current year, and then some goal setting for um, the next year. Following that review, the supervisor that will then complete their evaluation of the employee, meet with the employee, review that evaluation, and then finalize it with human resources. And so by the end of the calendar year, every employee will have gone through a formal evaluation process that includes a self-evaluation, a goal setting meeting, and then a final performance review with their supervisor. Okay, moving on to the next highlighted area that I'll mention. Um, and this isn't really a substantial change, but we, we kind of increase some language here to make it clear. Under section 3.01, it's found on page 22 of the handbook, that's timekeeping. We wanted to make sure that our employees understood that they are ultimately responsible for completing their time record. We've had some challenges in the past where employees may be not completing their time, time record accurately, completely, or wholly. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there was adequate language there to make sure that the employee understands that they are ultimately responsible for completing their time record. And that at the end of the day, if corrections need to be made to that time record, the employee, along with the employee supervisor, need to correct and approve those changes so that finance has the correct information. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that that was explicitly stated in that, in that section. Uh, moving on then to uh, section 3.05, which is found on page 24. This is related to call-in pay and minimum call-in time. And uh, my point here is just to highlight that uh, we added some language within this section to, to tackle two different issues. One, we wanted to ensure that every department head or supervisor has the explicit responsibility in determining when call-in work is necessary. Um, we've had situations in the past where, let's just say there is um, some type of work-related issue that's come up and an employee uh, or supervisor has determined that this issue can wait till Monday doesn't have to necessarily happen on Saturday. It's not a, a critical infrastructure issue, or even if it is, it's an issue that can be managed to the next day or something to that effect. We wanted to make sure that the department head and supervisor had that authority and understanding when that call-in situation should occur. Uh, we've had that uh, situation come up in the past, uh, in particular in our utility department. Our utility operators are afforded an on-call stipend of $150 per week. As part of that on-call rotation, they come in on Saturdays and Sundays, and those are call-in situations where they do their routine checks, our SCADA system, our tower checks, things of that nature. Um, in the event they come in, they complete their work, they go home, an issue arises, let's say Saturday night, the supervisor determines that that issue does not need to be resolved on Saturday, but rather can be handled on Sunday when that call-in person comes in the next day. So that supervisor would have the ability to make that decision, say, no, you're not going to come in again, get three hours of minimum call-in time. You're going to come in tomorrow when you would normally come in for your call-in period and complete the task at that time. So we wanted to make sure that the supervisor knew that they have that authority and responsibility in determining the work. Second, I'll mention that, um, not that we have this issue here, but it's come up in prior uh, places of, of employment for, for where I've been, that supervisors uh, should refrain from, or make every effort to refrain from contacting employees earlier than one hour before their desired start time for call-in situations. What would happen in other communities, again, not necessarily here, but we wanted to ensure that we set a standard for it, is that let's say we're in the middle of the winter and we recognize that a snowstorm is coming, coming into the area. And our streets operation supervisor says, yeah, I think I'm gonna have our crew come in early, two, three o'clock in the morning to start plowing. 
I'm going to call him at 11.30 at night to tell him, hey, uh, I think I'm going to have you come in around 2 or 3 o'clock, uh, but I'll call you probably about 1.30 to let you know. And then at 1.30, they call him again, tell him, oh, I'm going to have you actually come in at 4 o'clock now because the snow has been delayed, and then they come in at 4 o'clock. And so the idea was now you have all this interrupted sleep, and so the supervisor needs to be aware and cognizant of that and only call the employee at least one hour or no greater than one hour before the necessary time period. So the supervisor may recognize at 11.30 that I'm going to have my employees come in, um, but not to make routine or, or multiple calls in the middle of the night to alert them of that. Okay. Um, there's also several provisions in here that um, indicate when, when call-in time may be required. So as an example, emergency snow plowing or let's say a street sign is knocked over in the middle of the night by, um, by a motorist and that street sign is critical infrastructure, we need to replace it. Uh, maybe there's an emergency disaster like the storm we had this past summer, that would be a call-in type situation. Or maybe in the park side there's a rental issue, the employee can come in to, to deal with the rental issue in the park. What isn't considered call-in time is when something is being scheduled. Um, so as an example, scheduled meeting outside of standard work hours. The employees generally know that those are hours that you're going to be required to come in. You're scheduled to do it, so you know it. Doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get overtime, but you just won't get that minimum three-hour call-in pay because it's scheduled, it's known, and it's expected. Um, on the recreation side, any scheduled program set up or takedown. So again, let's say um, one of our park employees leaves at 4 o'clock and then they come back at 6 o'clock to set up for the food truck rally or movie in the park or something like that. That's a scheduled event. They know they're coming back in. They're not getting the call-in time of, of, in the three-hour minimum. And again, any other work that is scheduled with a specific start time prior to the end of the previous work day. Again, so this is pre-planned. As an employer, we have management right to dictate your schedule. And so for tomorrow, we're going to have you come in at this time to reflect that. That's not a call-in situation. It do again, doesn't necessarily eliminate the need to pay overtime for anything over 40 hours. It just means that you're not going to be given that three-hour minimum call-in pay because it was already scheduled for you. Any questions on that section? That can be a little bit of a, um, a doozy. Uh, next uh, area that's a policy change is under section 3.08. That's found on page 26. Um, this relates to vacancy coverage. So from time to time, we may have an employee that's incapacitated or maybe they've retired or resigned. Um, and in, in those situations where another employee is filling in for that role, for that prolonged period of time, greater than two weeks, um, there may be an opportunity to provide that employee some additional compensation for those fill-in periods. And, and this has come up in the past where we kind of just have this loose open-ended policy as it relates to kind of vacancy coverage pay. What this policy does is it kind of sets some framework so that it's being, per, being done equitably regardless of the employee. So in these two scenarios, the full vacancy coverage for a position of an equal or lesser pay grade uh, would advance that employee during the time of vacancy one step, which is basically equal to a 2% pay increase. Um, if it's a full vacancy coverage for a position of a greater pay grade, so let's say our accountant takes over for our finance director um, because our finance director is incapacitated for a period of time, um, that's a greater pay grade. So that full vacancy coverage, that employee would advance to the current step that they're in of the vacant position's higher pay grade during that position of vacancy because they're basically performing their work in the work of others. And that would, again, just be during that vacancy period. So that is uh, solely up to the village board's discretion, but at least there is framework to determine what that is versus, hey, let's just give this employee $1,000 or let's just give this employee $2,000. There's a structure to it. And again, at the end of the day, when those situations arise, 
the employee requests it in writing, it comes before the village board and the village board determines at its sole discretion what, what it would like to do. Okay, uh, moving on to section 3.10, which is found on page 27. Um, this is the wage and salary administration. All I'm going to say here is that this policy language matches the discussions we've had for the better part of the last two months as it relates to establishing the wage and salary matrix, the step process, the process in which to advance in the step system, as well as the village board's discretion to increase the matrix based on the the uh, consumer price index. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that because that'll be covered on the, another agenda item today. Section 3.10.1 uh, found on the next page on page 28 is again that performance-based compensation program. Again, we've talked about that the, the better part of the last couple months. That details that policy language along with an example what I will mention with this particular one is that in, in the policy there is an example where the village board, uh, let's hypothetically says, uh, they will allocate a pool of $50,000 to, to go towards merit pay bonuses. And then based on the performance reviews of each of the employees, um, there could be lump sum payments made to those individual employees. The village manager ultimately would devise the the formula for how we're going to allocate that $50,000, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the $50,000 has to be spent. So generally speaking, in, in my role, I'll, I'll use a singular lump sum amount. I'm not going to start narrowing, the, narrow, narrowing it down to the dollar or pennies, right? So $50,000 is allocated. In this example, people that scored exceptional got $3,000, employees that got um, scored commendable, received a $1,500 total. Based on the numbers, that gets me to about $46,500. I feel like I'm pretty good, right? I got close to $50,000. I didn't have to spend all of it, but I got to a fair and um, um, even rate. Okay, next item, if we're gonna go on to section 4.12, this is on page 35, it's related to vacation. A Couple quick highlights that I wanna make here is that under the prior handbook, we identified vacation in the term of days. In the revised handbook, we, we define it in the term of hours. And the reason for that is that we have employees that will work 37 and a half hours that are considered full-time, and we have employees that work 40 hours per week that are considered full-time. Each of them get different amount of hours for each day. So 37 and a half hour employee gets seven and a half hours. A 40 hour employee gets eight hours. Uh, so, and then in addition to that, we identify our supervisors that are not represented under a union contract in public safety. Uh, we have our 24 hour employees. They're in the term of days because it is a day. It's a 24 hour day. Um, and then our 40 hour work weeks for those employees are in the term of hours. The other thing I will mention is that under vacation uh, from our prior handbook, we made two changes to the amount of vacation that would be given to uh, certain employees. First, we gave the equivalent of an additional day of vacation to each of the length of service table uh, areas. And that's directly related to a change that we're proposing for our holidays. And I'll explain that after this section. The next is we um, split up our length of service table by adding a, uh, another tier to it. Uh, our prior table had your length of service for your start through your first end of calendar year. And then the next tier was your second calendar year of employment through year six. So you had to work here one to seven years before you could advance to what is the equivalent of three weeks of vacation. So what we effectively did is we made it from the start of year two, year calendar year two, to year three would be two weeks, the equivalent of two weeks of vacation. And then years four through six, we gave the equivalent of three weeks of vacation. So we did increase a benefit to our employees, um, but based on the, the standard tenure of our employees, as well as when we um, perform lateral hires, 
we're often finding ourselves negotiating as part of the offer three weeks of vacation anyway because they're coming to us with six, seven, eight years of experience. And in order for that, or in order for us to effectively poach them from another agency, we need to provide that. So then it aligns with our policy. Can I ask a couple questions on the vacation yep. real quick just so I understand it? So someone when they start they come in with, if they're the 37.5 hour employee, they come in with 97.5 hours when they start. They don't have to put in a year before they actually get vacation, is that correct? So the first year, so from their start date through the end of that calendar year, it's prorated based on a number of weeks that are remaining in that calendar year. Okay. And then January 1 following their start date, they would be allocated with that full, let's let's just say they were offered the 97 and a half, that's where they would get that. And the 97 and a half comes from where? Because if it's two weeks of vacation, it would be 75, right? If you're 37.5 or am I in math off? Where's the 97.5 coming from? It's a from? little bit more than two weeks, so it's actually 12 days. Okay, I was wondering, okay. Yeah. And it's the same then for the 40 hours, it's 12 days. So Correct. someone starting here gets 12 days of vacation. Correct. When they start prorated that first year. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the, to the next section then under holidays. So 4.13, page 36. Um, we had previously three half day holidays. So Christmas Eve. Um, New Year's Eve and then Good Friday were considered half-day holidays where we would close our offices at noon and the employees would get the latter part of that day off. Um, half-day holidays are pretty cumbersome administratively and um, not always fun that way from an operation standpoint. So what we are proposing as part of this policy is it essentially taking December 24th and making that a full day holiday, so it's no longer a half day, and then eliminating New Year's Eve and Good Friday as half day holidays, and then in turn for that, giving each of the employees a vacation day. So as I mentioned before, we added a day of vacation to the table. That's to reflect the fact that they lost one of those holidays. So the village would then be open on New Year's Eve, full day, as well as Good Friday. If an employee wants to take off those days, certainly can do that using vacation, compensatory time, or any other approved leave um, for the appropriate purpose. Okay, I'm um, just going to mention that uh, under section 4.14.4, this is the sick leave conversion upon retirement. This is found on page 39. We've made no significant changes to our current policy on that. Um, what we intended to do here is just clarify the language as to who receives uh, the percent benefit based on the nature of their position. What I will mention is that the prior handbook had some carve outs for specific positions at the village that would receive a higher percent conversion at the end of employment. Our committee um, recommended that we update that language because a number of those positions were specific to people and not necessarily to positions. So as examples, they had like financial specialist or as financial analyst specialist. Um, and what the intent was is that we had specific employees at the last, the last time the handbook was written originally back in 2014 um, we had specific individuals that were kind of grandfathered into this extra conversion percentage. Those employees retired, have left the organization, and now that provision no longer is applicable. Um, but we do have at least two individuals that still meet that criteria from the old handbook, that being the GIS coordinator and the confidential executive secretary. So we just cleared the language up that it's the current incumbent in those roles as of the date of adoption that would be applicable. Once those individuals are no longer with the village, retirement or res resignation, um, then that, that provision would go away. We're getting there, bear with me. Next section is uh, 5.05, .05, that's found on page 44. It's village cellular phones and portable tablet devices. 
The only thing I'm going to mention here is that we made a more robust policy as it surrounds our village cell phone usage. Uh, so certain positions are issued a village cell phone um, and that's determined based on need. And then if those phones are issued, uh, the village retains certain rights as it relates to that phone. We do have individuals that have been determined as a village phone being necessary. Um, so in lieu of that employee carrying a village phone and their own personal phone, they can agree to a cellular phone usage agreement and stipend. Um, so that way you don't have to carry two phones. And we do currently that, we do currently allow that as practice, uh, but we do have employees that are being provided different stipend amounts for who knows what reason. So this policy essentially creates it so that it's standard. If it's a voice and text only plan, it's a $20 stipend. If the position requires some kind of data plan, maybe a smartphone to that degree, it's a $50 stipend. So and we have employees anywhere from $10 to $50 and it just depends. So we're gonna evaluate each position to determine which plan is necessary and then adjust the stipend to reflect that. Uh, I do want to mention that we do have a policy in here as well as it relates to electronic devices and driving. So our employees should not be texting on their phone and doing things of that nature while driving, regardless if it's a village issued phone or a personal device. All right, the next one, this is the one that's going to generate the most questions. I just know it. Uh, section 5.10 found on page 49, more specifically, 5.10.1, business and hours of operation. So it's been requested since I've started um, of the employee group that we modify our hours minimally during the summer months to have a shortened Friday workday. Um, and so this particular section addresses that very concern. Um, what is being proposed here is that essentially from Labor Day to, or the Monday, or Tuesday, excuse me, following Labor Day to the Friday preceding Memorial Day, those would be considered our regular operating hours. So we'd operate as we are today, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. for the office, and um, for our shop employees, our maintenance employees, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. Then from the Tuesday following Memorial Day to the Friday preceding Labor Day, we would operate under what is called our summer operating hours. So for the office staff, we would open the office from 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday, and then 7.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Friday. For our operating staff, we would operate 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Thursday and 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Fridays uh, as well. So again, we, we reviewed this quite a bit with our staff, um, both in the office as well as our field staff. We talked to a number of supervisors. Our primary concern was garbage pickup, to be quite honest with you, and ensuring that we can still provide for Friday pickup. Uh, in talking with staff, they feel that they can still accommodate the Friday pickup by operating the, uh, the third truck. So instead of having two trucks out on Friday, we send out our third truck, uh, which we have operationally, and we can accomplish the same route in the same amount of time. Um, so again, um, looking at that, looking at other municipalities, this is uh, becoming more of a standard practice by offering these summer hours. In fact, there are some municipalities that are going to this year round as well. We are not proposing that just for summer hours. Did Why Rex was it requested? Is it just not busy on Friday afternoons? It, it's not operationally busy on Friday afternoons. We'll get a few walk-ins. Um, we'll get very few phone calls. In fact, some of our office staff have tracked the number of walk-ins and phone calls and things of like that, um, and they're just not substantial. We have been flexing our office staff's hours as well. So we've been doing that for the better part of the last year and a half where um, like Carrie, for example, she could come in a half hour or an hour earlier, uh, Monday through Thursday, and then leave half a day on Friday. One of the other office staff have to provide coverage then, so there is some flexibility that way. Uh, we've been able to manage just fine with less and fewer staff Friday afternoons. There just isn't the demand for that. 
Doesn't necessarily mean that a supervisor has to approve it. So as I think Tracy was going in the park and rec realm, when you have programs and events, no, we're not shutting down programs or events or staffing for that matter for community center. They still have to operate. Our clerk's office from time to time has to conduct absentee voting, voter registration, things of that nature. We have to be open for those circumstances. Um, and we could certainly make ourselves available by appointment as well. Um, that's a lot of times what other municipalities do that if there's a meeting that has to occur and the only availability is Friday afternoons, we can make ourselves available for those times as well. I think one of the, <clears throat> we did this throughout the manual too, is looking at opportunities to be proactive to what can help, um, whether it's the vacation and getting rid of the floating holiday, the vacation looks a lot better, people like those types of things, right? But from a retention standpoint and the flexibility and just the way that the work staff is changing, right? And the competitiveness, I think, of the market. So I think there's a lot of areas in here that we discussed you know, hey, Ann or whoever, what have you seen, right? Through other municipalities and villages and and just other industries, it's it's just kind of the way that things are trending. So what can we do to, um, I don't know, try to have the best retention that we can? And if there's flexibility because people are asking and we think operationally that we can do it, that was those were some really big conversations that we had so that we can, like I said, be competitive and people can say, oh, that's great. And like they listened and, you know, and, and again, that seems like a big win, even though it's three and a half, maybe four hours for some people on Friday. But um, I think proactively, we looked at a lot of those things to change. So let me ask this. Let's say there's a big tournament going on on the weekend and Rex needs to call in staff to work all day on Friday to get ready for that tournament. Is that going to mean overtime for all those people that are staying later? How is that going to work out? And most of the Rex's programming staff are exempt employees as well. So just like they do right now, I mean, they work evenings, you know, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. So oftentimes they're being compensated by being able to provide flexible scheduling. So taking some time off later that week or maybe later the next couple weeks to reflect that extra time commitment. I know oftentimes they'll take time off later in the season as well, just knowing that summer is a busy time. Um, it, again, this the um, part-time staff, the seasonal staff, they're not necessarily affected no. by these operating right. hours, so they're going to get right. paid their regular rates of pay anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's like our maintenance guy, so the maintenance foreman, he's not an exempt employee, correct? He's an hourly? Correct. So then, you know, he would, because right. sometimes the park maintenance guys are going to have to stay a little later, so then they would get overtime for that time on Friday. They could potentially, or the supervisor, Rex in particular, could say, you know what, this schedule, because of our programming that we have on Friday, and if you, for some reason we need you here till Friday, then we'll, you'll take off earlier or maybe come in later that day to reflect that. So the supervisor still has that discretion to schedule hours as necessary with the idea that it should be done in a manner to provide the highest degree of efficiency so we're not paying unnecessary overtime. Okay, so and Rex didn't have a concern with this, obviously, because he looked at this as well. Well, I think Rex has a concern in particular with this one. Yeah. He's probably the only department head that has general concerns about that, just from a programming standpoint. Yeah. Um, but again, we have departments right now that are operating modified schedules, so um, we, we can't necessarily satisfy every department's operational needs. Um, but, you know, the... There is an opportunity, I think, with flexibility from that department to still provide those opportunities. Okay. Yeah. So the, the hours don't equal out. I mean, you're adding a half hour every morning, which adds like two and a half hours, but you're taking away four in the afternoon, right? So what happens to all the benefits and all the, you know, like if you work 40 hours, you get this. And if you work Yeah, so under both scenarios, employees either are working 37 and a half or 40 hours a week. So under the meal break, so that next section under 5.10.2, during the regular operating hours, employees are, are, are provided a full hour of an unpaid break. Under the summer operating hours, that would go to a half hour mm -hmm. to account for the fact that they're not, not there as long. So again, that's the trade-off. Okay, um, next section here quickly under essential personnel, so that's 5.11.1. Um, 
This is related to emergency closures. So let's say in the event that we get a 30 inch snowstorm on April 4th, it's not election day, it's the day after of course. Um, and the village president or village manager decides that there is no way we should tell non-essential personnel to arrive to work. It's not safe for them, it's not conducive for them to get here. We're gonna close the office. Um, this has probably happened once in the last 30 years, if at all. Um, this procedure basically addresses that issue because it has come up once in the last 30 years. So essential personnel as deemed um, under the guide, uh, under the, the handbook are anybody public safety, anybody public works, anybody parks, rec, and forestry maintenance because they're performing emergency services work, snow control, so on and so forth. Um, and then anybody else that's deemed essential for the nature of the closure. So maybe there's a major flooding incident or some other major cat catastrophic event. Um, those employees that are required to come into work, come into work and earn their wage as they normally would. The other employees that are told not to come to work, it's for the safety of themselves, the safety of the organization, and, and so we're basically telling you don't come to work. Do not earn a wage today. So to be fair to them, what we would do is we would provide them with that day's compensation as a paid administrative day. So a paid administrative leave. For those employees that do have to report to work, so those essential people are saying, well, that's not fair. They don't have to work and I'm getting paid and they're getting paid for not coming to work. I'm working. Um, so what we would do under this plan is we would provide compensatory time off consistent with the amount of hours that they actually worked on that day of closure. So if they work eight hours, they would get an additional eight hours of compensatory time that they could then use for a future day off when it's not essential for them to be there. So it kind of makes everybody equal. So there's an incentive for you, for us to say, don't come to work. We do not want you here because it's unsafe for you to, to, to come to work, okay? So that's that section. Uh, the next section on the next page, 51, 5.11.4, uh, we did provide language for temporary telecommuting. Prior to in 2014, telecommuting wasn't a thing. So now we have a provision within our handbook to allow for telecommuting. Um, I'll just mention under 5.14.3, that's found on page 54, that's meal expenses. Um, we had allowances identified in our handbook, but those allowances for meals were 10, 9, 8, 9, 10 years old. Uh, obviously expenses have increased for hotel, lodging, meal expenses. Um, so what we identified is that we will reimburse employees that are on required travel for meal and lodging expenses for the actual expenses up to the general government, uh, U.S. General Services Administration's allowance for that location. So actual expense up to that amount. If the per diem under USGSA is $20 and I spend $14, I only get reimbursed for $14. So the receipts have to come in, all that stuff. If I spend $25 and the GSA says it's $20, I only get $20. Um, and then finally, to just conclude uh, the last heavy section that we kind of uh, attempted to make a little bit more robust was under section 5.17. That's related to social networking websites and online communications. Uh, that's found on page 57. And again, 2014, social media was, uh, was around, but maybe not as prolific as it is today, and maybe not as varied back then. It might have been Facebook and Twitter, and Instagram maybe was being conceived at that point. YouTube was relatively new, things of that nature. Um, so we identified some specific language for code of conduct as it relates to social networking and connecting with your colleagues online. So with that, um, those are the substantive uh, changes to the handbook policy-wise. Um, again, we uh, reviewed this with our staff team, with our department heads, um, made some modifications to those reviews, and at this point, I guess I'll entertain any questions that you have regarding the handbook. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I, I was impressed. That's an impressive handbook. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read through it fairly carefully and then decided I just trust my people and I'm not gonna really go over every little 
sub paragraph A, B, one, <laughs> two, but I think you did a great job. I'll second that opinion. I did read through it, and from the perspective of someone who's worked within local government organizations, the level of detail and breadth and focus on new and emerging areas and how to work in retention into the handbook, it was really well done. So great job to the team that put this together. I just had a question on um, Wisconsin retirement. In the, in the book, it's 2.04, I think it was on page 21 of the packet. Um, real quick. It had um, 1,200 hours in there. Did that get changed? Wasn't it 600 for a while? If you went over 600, then you kicked into Wisconsin retirement? Yeah, I believe that was a maybe 10 years ago now that changed from 600 to 1200 hours mm -hmm. so any seasonal or temporary employee if as long as they stay under 1200 then they don't kick into wisconsin retirement now Cor correct okay. yep okay any other questions it's nice work on this definitely um i'll entertain a motion move to approve second we have a motion and a Second, to uh, approve uh, the employee handbook dated October 13th, 2022. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Seven, seven, three, adopting organization chart and position descriptions. Joel. Uh, yeah, so included in your handbook, as we've been discussing for the last uh, couple, three months now, is the role of basically going through and either crafting or updating or revising position descriptions for each position with the village, um, in particular any non-sworn position from public safety, um, as well as all other positions throughout the village. So in your packet, there are some draft positions. There are some needed modifications from those job descriptions that were presented. Um, so there's some cleansing and some sanitizing that has to occur yet. Uh, but ultimately, under the village ordinances, the village manager is responsible for ensuring that each position has an up-to-date job description. So this is our first effort to, to doing that. Um, along with that, you obviously have the org chart, and the org chart corresponds to each of the positions that were included in your packet. Um, just to kind of give you an overview of the process here again, uh, so we employed Ann and her um, um, partner, Sam, over at Human Resources Consulting to basically take whatever old job descriptions we had on file, and we didn't necessarily have a job description for every position, but basically take what we had Re rewrite, revise the description based on the language in those old descriptions and put them into the updated format. Any position that didn't have a position description, create one, which there were a handful of positions that did not have a position description, and create one. And then we had some positions that were, at some point, combined positions. Maybe they included one position description and another position description, and at some point they were conjoined, if you will, into one singular position, so taking those and melding those together. So Ann and Sam from HRC forwarded those to us. We then in turn gave those out to the department heads to review, to revise and update, and then provide back to us to then present to committee for review. Um, not gonna go into a whole lot of detail. These are ultimately kind of the essential duties for each of the positions and the general requirements thereof. Uh, also identifies, obviously, reporting structure. And once they are finalized and compiled by the department heads and through our office with HR, um, there'll be a salary and grade assigned to each of those positions as well based on the matrix that will be discussed under the next agenda item. So with that, I guess I'll, I know uh, I've left uh, some messages with Tracy today about some, some corrections, so we'll work through those and get those corrected. But if there are other updates or corrections to the position descriptions that you have found, uh, we can certainly talk about it here tonight, or you can simply forward those to me, 
and I can make those adjustments with the department heads to make sure that they're accurate and reflective of the positions. Okay. So they're not finalized yet. You don't want us to move on anything yet. No, I uh, well, it, essentially what we're looking for from committee tonight is that if there's any corrections, changes, things of, the, of that nature, if you can get those to me and then ultimately we'll bring those forward to village board for consideration. Okay. I just want to mention one from Tom Selk had called me and asked me to bring it up and since um, our finance director is here, he was wondering about listing that he is serving as our village treasurer. I know it does say in the position description that you do these tasks of the villa, of the treasurer type tasks. Um, that was his comment. He had just asked me to bring it up um, tonight as well. Yep. Yeah, we do that similarly with the clerk position, identify the statutory reference to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I sent a bunch to Joel, um, but there are some positions that driver's license were not listed. I would assume that they would require driver's license. Um, there was some verbiage that didn't see it should have been there. Um, I had a question on the finance payroll assistant, um, if a bachelor's degree should be required for that. It was not, I don't believe. So if you can just look at those, ask if you have any questions, please reach out to me. But there were just some in, things and um, one of the um, position description had the old um, title, not the village manager, director of administrative services. So that's really old. Mm -hmm. um, so there are just some oddball things I saw, I found in there. There's a lot of job descriptions. So it was uh, there are a cumbersome. ton of them. Yes, there are. <laughs> <laughs> and Tracy, thanks for uh, going over that. Mm -hmm. um, You're welcome. You know, it's for some of us, including me. I, I fly through it and got kind of trust. Yeah, and I started do a great job on then, this, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got you know you do a good job of going through there with a fine tooth comb. I appreciate that. Thank you. And that's you know it's a good good working relationship when everybody's contributing to the final result because there's just so much data and information to kind of get a blind eye to it at some point. Yeah, you don't see it after a while. Well, and there's a lot of changes too and things like that. So I think one of the things that the, these job descriptions coming with the handbook and the performance management changes is something that we wanted to do together and. I'm glad it got done. It probably took a little longer just because Sam and I were seeing just random letters after <laughs> 65 of them. But you have this, you know, this 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 pool of dollars, right? And this performance management system, which is entirely built right on job descriptions. How do we manage someone's performance and what their expectations are and give them clarity if the department heads and the employees themselves and the board and everybody else hasn't seen it, it's not accurate. So while I think there's a lot of changes and things that new processes that need to be explained and probably a little bit of training on. Um, we have a very good opportunity to kind of lump all of these things together because they truly back each other, right? Um, I don't think the performance management system or the handbook or any of those things will work unless um, our people are here and they know what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it and how they're supposed to do it and, and we give them that direction. So really tonight we're not approving the position descriptions because they're still in a draft format, correct? Right. And correct. then you're looking at village board doing correct. the approval? Correct, yep. Okay, anything else? Allison, you're good? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, seven, uh, four, correct. yeah. Consider, discuss, act on proposed 2023 village wage and salary matrix, Joel. So again, this is gonna be similar to the job descriptions. This kind of gives you um, an overview. We've talked about the wage and salary matrix for the better part of the last three months. Once the position descriptions are finalized, that's really the defining factor for how we score uh, the matrix. But now you can see the complete position analysis for each of the positions that were identified um, with a position description uh, and how those are scored. So again, what we've done, in addition to the position descriptions, each department head was given the position analysis matrix for review to analyze and have discussions with their employees to make sure that it aligns with the position description. So some department heads have done that, um, some maybe have not quite gotten or fulfilled that, that request. Uh, or others simply have said that it aligns with the position descriptions uh, as it should. So 
Each position obviously scored on those eight criteria. Those criteria were based on uh, items within the position description, so it is wholly objective. I think the biggest challenge that we found in the exercise is that oftentimes employees would like to evaluate themselves versus the position. So what we've described to the employees is that think about removing yourself from the position and if we were going to hire this position today, what would be the expectations? How would we advertise for it? What would be a competitive wage to reflect that position? Uh, and then once doing that, then they can kind of see, okay, yeah, I know I have 25 years of experience, but we're not hiring somebody at 25 years of experience. Where that value and longevity comes from is the matrix itself. It's, it's moving from grade one through grade 15. That's where we value your tenure and experience with the organization. Um, so again, uh, what we're looking for is just feedback from the committee tonight to make sure we're on the right track, that what you're seeing is kind of what we've described over the better part of the last three months, finalized job descriptions, and then uh, at the end, this information will go back to the board for final adoption and then implementation. Uh, with that, I'll just touch on uh, one quick thing under the matrix itself. So. After we have scored positions, um, I went through anecdotally and looked at most employees to verify whether or not they fell within their current salary grade or salary range uh, or, or hourly range uh, with their current rate as opposed to their scored rate. And with the exception of one employee, all employees fall somewhere within their salary range, which is good, okay? There is one particular employee that's outside of that, and I'll explain kind of the process for how we're gonna do that in a moment. But what we're effectively going to do when this gets implemented is that employees, let's say an employee is grade five, and they are making $27 and um, 90 cents per hour, okay? Under grade five, what we would do is we would place that employee at the next logical step from their wage. So we're not gonna pull them down, but advance them to that next logical step. So under grade five for that hourly rate, they would move to step eight, which is 2831, okay? So they advance that next logical step. And then as of January 1, pending our performance review process, they would be eligible for a step increase, which would then put them at step nine, so 2888. And so that's effectively how we would get them into the matrix, okay? So that could be up to a 4% increase from last year, depending on where they fit. It could be a little more than 2% or it could be closer to 4%, again, just depending on where their wage is. Now we do have a few people, there are a handful of employees that have been here for an extended period of time, 25 plus years. And when they score out, they're showing somewhere in the hiring range. So let's say they're at step two, but they've been here 25 years. They really should be on the higher end of that range. And so what we're proposing with those particular situations is that Let's say they come in at step two and they've been here greater than five years um, and they're in the, below that hiring range, we're gonna advance them outside of the hiring range the number of steps that they're into the hiring range. So in this example under step two, they would move to step eight, right? And then they'd be able to advance their next step January one. So we get them outside of the hiring range, they should be certainly above midpoint and that would be the goal. If they came in at step six, they would move to step 12, right? So again, we're trying to get them outside that hiring range. For the employee that comes in outside of the range, we kind of, we evaluate it based on that position and we may end up moving them outside of that hiring range as well to coincide with that, the fact that they're not even in their range, okay? How we're budgeting uh, going into next year, what you'll see is that We've included uh, a cost of living increase into our wages budget that will accommodate that up to 4% increase. And then in the budget, you'll see a wage reserve of $50,000 to account for those individuals, those handful of individuals that are in their hiring range that need to be beyond midpoint. So we should be able to account for those changes 
within the 2023 budget. So, you said cost of living 4%, is that what you just said? We're budgeting a four, uh, up to 4%, 4% because of getting them into the matrix and it could be up to 4%. Okay. Yeah. So any questions on the matrix? I think that that solution that you shared for those legacy employees is a really good one. And, you know, over time through attrition retirements, all new employees will come on under this, this model and we'll get to a place where it's seamless. But that seems like a great compromise. And I think that the matrix and the methodology behind it is really strong. I agree. And, it, and it's, it's, it's nice and uh, um, impressive that just about everybody falls into the matrix already. Yeah, that that's nice to hear. Good news. I think it goes to what, you know, how fair this is, how well this is done. Anything else? Anybody? Are you going to want a motion on this or no? No, nope. just okay. feedback so it'll tie to the job descriptions. This will go before the village board though for adoption. So just like the position descriptions. Okay. Thank you. All right, seven five. Consider act uh, discuss act on changes the village health insurance plan. I, th I think this is going to Greg, maybe. No, nope. uh, no, I can handle it. And Greg can kind of chime in. So a little bit of Greg, a little bit of me. Um, so open enrollment for our medical plan design is coming up November first. Uh, in reviewing our medical plan design, it was identified that. Over the course of the last couple, three years that we've been um, essentially spending more than we've been taking in in premium equivalents and thus reducing our fund balance and our health insurance fund that supports our, our um, self-insurance program. Uh, so in order to essentially build that fund back up to a preferred amount of dollars to provide some um, contingency, if you will, in the event that we have a high cost claimant, uh, we would like to make some changes to our plan design to account for that. So very similarly to our handbook, to the position descriptions, to the wage matrix, we have a staff health committee that reviews this information and then ultimately provides a recommendation for changes to plan design. Uh, that again, ultimately is up to the, the board to, to determine. Um, what we are proposing for next year's plan would be uh, two specific and critical changes. One, uh, looking to increase the employee deductible from 1400 in, 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 for an individual uh, or $2,800 for a family in network to 2000 and 4000. Now I will mention that last year our, our plan design was the lowest amount, lowest deductible, de deductible amount allowed by law and law was changing anyway, so the law was gonna require us go, to go to a $1,500 to a, and a $3,000 deductible regardless. So we were, we're gonna have a change in a deductible regardless, but we are proposing through this committee's recommendation to increase the deductible another $500 uh, to $2,000 and $4,000. The out of network would match that, um, so that would go to a $4,000 and $8,000 deductible. We would make no changes to our out-of-pocket maximum, no recommended changes, and then no changes to our percent share between co-insurance, so still a 90-10 uh, match for in-network. In addition to that, we are looking at increasing our premium contribution. So currently, if an employee completes their health risk assessment or their health, health risk incentive, um, they pay zero dollars towards their premium. Uh, what we are proposing is that the employees would pay a 2.5% premium contribution if they complete their HRA requirements. If they choose not to complete their HRA requirements, they'll pay 5%, so an additional 2.5%. Uh, by doing so, that will produce a net savings of approximately $77,000 to the general fund budget uh, or to the health, health insurance program and then that ultimate savings would be used towards building that fund balance again back into the fund uh, so that we can get to uh, a contingency level that we think is appropriate. Ideally, we'd want to get to about a six month reserve in funds so that if we have some type of catastrophic loss or a series of catastrophic losses, there's sufficient fund balance to support that program. 
So, and Greg, I don't know if you have any anything in addition that you would want to comment on that. Yeah, the the only thing that I would add is, we're, what we're trying to do is follow also what the auditors had recommended. They had brought that up to the attention of the board during the audit review that that we were getting to levels in that fund balance that were critical, and we needed to take some steps and actions to move that balance up. So this is what we're doing. They don't expect you to turn around in one year and you know add half a million dollars, but that you've shown that you're you're active in a plan and an effort to to address that that shortcoming in the fund balance. Uh, are we going to be adding the employee plus children option? And then what would be, have you determined exactly what the deductibles and cost in that for the, that would be, or is that yet to be determined? So the employee plus children follows that same family deductible. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. We did uh, propose a, an additional tier to have the employee plus children, but they still follow the family deductible plan. Okay. Obviously, based on the information that was in your packet, it's a much cheaper premium to have that. We find that based on the data that's presented to us, that it's really the employee plus spouse that generates the highest amount of claim cost to the plan. Children, generally speaking, are relatively healthy. They don't have hip replacements or things of that nature. It's usually the employee plus spouse, the kids are out of the house and now, um, they may be a higher higher claimant for that reason. So with that, if 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 it's agreeable to the committee, this one we would recommend um, a motion from the committee recommending to the board um, the changes to the plan design if it's agreeable. Okay. Any other questions? No. Nope. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the deductible increase of two thousand for a single and four thousand for a family, and employee premium contribution increase of two point five percent. But that's only if they do HRA, correct? And then it would otherwise it would be five percent if correct. they do not do the HRA. Correct. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. All right, items for next agenda. If anybody would like to see anything talk about in our next meeting. So next meeting is the special joint finance committee and village board meeting. I believe that is on November 15th, correct? correct. So um, budgets will be distributed out to the group around Greg, November 2nd-ish. I remember correctly. It'll be the Friday, November second, is it, or the first, or third, one of those. <laughs> the, fr the first Friday in November. Yeah, first Friday in November. So you you basically have two full weekends <laughs> prior to the Tuesday night meeting. That's always a goal to to uh, to read the whole thing from front to cover, every word. Yay, Tracy right? will do that. We'll have a, a pop quiz <laughs> before we actually do the budget proceedings, just so you know. A pop okay. quiz. Well, the handbook was a great warm up exercise. Right. Exactly, yep. <laughs> All right, nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you. And then Thank you.